Hello, everyone, and welcome to another virtual edition of the I've Heard of Her discussion series. Um, today, we are going to be talking about Ada Lovelace. We're going to get some mathematics up in here. It's going to be great. So who are we? Let's talk about it. Uh, my name is Samantha Mahalik. I am the registrar uh, for the Civil War Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We're part of the Kenosha Museum campus which is three museums right on the lake shore. Uh, it's pretty great. I'm part of the collections department. I help with the care and uh, tracking all the things we have. So that's exciting. And this is my lovely co-host. And I'm Jen Edgington. I'm curator of social studies education. So I primarily work in the Civil War Museum and in the Kenosha Public Museum. And we're really excited to talk about um, our topic today. And part of the reason that we do this is the continuation of celebration of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And also just to elevate women's stories because oftentimes they're overlooked throughout the history books. So mm -hmm. we're really excited. We're gonna get started about talking about Ada Lovelace. Mm -hmm. You can see a drawing of right here. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about her childhood and early life. So she was born Augusta Ada Byron on December 10th, 1815 in Middlesex, England, which is now part of London. So now it's in a happening metropolis. Um, and she's actually the only legitimate child of Lord Byron, the poet. Um, and her mother was Lady Anne Isabella Milbank Byron and Lord Byron was 27. His, her mother was 23 when they had Ada. Um, and their marriage was really unhappy. So it wasn't um, a very calm house. Well, uh, yeah. And then um, right after Ada's born, actually her mother leaves her father. And um, Lord Byron left England a few weeks after that and never sees his daughter again. Um, he dies when he's in Greece when Ada is only eight years old. So he only sees her as a newborn, unfortunately, but she, he still um, is part of her life through letters, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he keeps like a photograph of her on his desk, um, but that's about it. That's their, that was their relationship, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Absolutely. But her mother and her are close throughout her whole life. Um, it sounds a little overbearing when I start talking about it, but her mother insists that she's actually um, tutored in math and science, which is completely unusual for the time. And part of that is because her mother is hoping to um, kind of push her away from the arts and the humanities like her, her dad was in hopes that um, she really would um, not have her father's moody and unpredictable life that he had. So um, the mom kind of pushes her towards math and science. And um, she actually calls Byron um, the princess of palindromes, which is really funny to me. <laughs> so she's studying math. Um, and the mother actually makes her lay still for extended periods of time to learn self-control. So again, when I was talking about being maybe a little over-controlling, um, the mom is teaching her how to be completely opposite of her father. So trying to kind of push out her father's spontaneity, her father's um, arts, writing, all of that, and replace it with science, math, and very structured um, time, basically. And so when Ada is 11, her mother takes her on a year long European tour. And when she returns, she's enthusiastically doing things like studying what is called flyology, um, which is imagining how to mimic a bird with steam powered machines, which seems like something from a, like now a Victorian novel, like steampunk novel. Yeah. <laughs> But she was doing this. She was trying to understand how it worked. She was trying to understand at 11, um, you know, how the world worked around her, which I think is 
is really amazing for an 11 year old now, but especially 11 year old back in the 1800s when women were not being pushed into math and science and actually for the most part were kind of being shunned away from it. Um, during her childhood, she did get sick with measles and was bedridden for three years. So her childhood was a, was a little rough, but it also was very privileged too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, I mean, they are part of the elite of English society. So um, after she's really sick, she's bedridden. Um, she gets well enough that at age 17, she can have her coming out. So at that time, um, if you were of a certain social class, um, you would have basically uh, presented to the king at court. And then you were allowed to like go to parties um, because, and basically you're now eligible for marriage. Um, but at this part, one of these parties, um, Ada meets Charles Babbage. Um, he was the, I'm gonna say this wrong, Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge. Um, and they met on a part at a party on June 5th 1853, sorry, uh, 20, only 26 days after her presentation at court. So this is really early in her coming out. She has this um, meeting that basically changes the course of her life uh, because Babbage becomes a mentor to Ada. Uh, he later said that um, she was an enchantress who has thrown her magical spell around the most abstract of sciences and has grasped it with a, for with a force which few masculine intellects could have exerted over it. And he called her um, his, the Enchantress of Numbers. So there's some cool uh, nicknames in this. Story, yeah, anyway. she's so cool. Um, yeah, so <laughs> she um, around this time also meets another uh, female mathematician, uh, Mary Somerville. And uh, Somerville uh, encourages Ada to read like Euclid and start getting the background of mathematics and uh, setting a base uh, and in addition to the things she learned as a child. Um, in 1834, Ada took a trip with her mother uh, around Northern England. They were on a philanthropic tour of mills up there and Ada was just fascinated by all of the machines and the technology that these mills were using. Um, and so at this time, she's talking to Charles Babbage, like all the time he was sharing his work with her on a difference engine he was working on. Um, it was designed to perform mathematic equations. So it was basically like a really early computer that could do math. Um, it's, you can see it, um, there's pictures of it online and it's at, actually at a museum in London. Uh, it's really cool looking. It's like all brass. It's got a bunch of, I don't know, different knobs and things. I don't understand how it works, but they did. Um, and her math work was put on hold a little bit for her domestic life. We're gonna get into that a little bit later, but Babbage, he always came back to her with little product projects or writing her letters to ask for her opinions about the work he was doing on. Um, so eventually uh, she starts formally studying mathematics. She goes to the University College of London in 1839 and she studies under Augustus de Morgan. Um, this was actually after the birth of her third and final child. So she had done a little bit of domestic life and now she wants to focus more on math again. Um, and she, it, it's that she really hated calculus, which I feel like most people can relate to. <laughs> um, in 1843, this was her major contribution to the field. Um, so she basically published a translation of an article that an Italian engineer, Luigi Manabria, wrote in French for a Swiss magazine. So there's a lot of different nationalities here. <laughs> But um, basically she translated this article and 
in addition to just translating the article for English publication, she also added extensive notes to the article. Um, and in the end, her notes on the article were three times as long as the original article um, because she corrected some things and stuff like that. Um, the notes included the first published description of a stepwise sequence of operations for solving certain math problems. Um, and for this, she's often um, referred to as the first programmer. Um, a lot of her work is used, was used uh, to create computer programming, uh, which this is, we're in 1843. So this is much before the first computer. Um, she, like I said, did, corrected things. Um, the article contains statements by Ada that from a modern perspective are like completely visionary. She speculated that the engine might act upon other things besides numbers. Um, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. Um, the idea that a machine could manipulate symbols in accordance with rules and that a number could represent entities other than quantity uh, mark the fundamental transition from calculation to computation. Um, so yeah, she saw that if we can do this with a machine, why can't we then extrapolate and do these other things with a machine? Um, this analytical engine was always a theoretical thing. It actually was never built, unlike um, his previous uh, creation. Uh, and she tried to partner with Babbage on the actual creation of the analytical engine to make this a physical reality. Um, it never happened. Babbage never built it. And um, her health actually took a turn for the worse and she had domestic issues that eventually took priority. So unfortunately, that's really the end of her professional life. Um, so she she only did this one major thing only, but it also but it was a huge contribution to uh, math and science. So it's a pretty awesome one thing if you have to do one thing in your life. And she did it in such a, a short time period. Like mm -hmm. she was very young when she accomplished these things. Yeah, and exactly. Be, yeah, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about her personal life too, because it was so important to her. Her work and her personal life were both equal in her eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so she married William King on July 8th, 1835. At She was the age eight, 19 and he was 29. Um, he was the eighth Baron King and was a friend of the mathematician, the female mathematician, Mary Somerville's son. So that's how they probably met. Um, he becomes the Earl of Lovelace three years later in 1838, which is why she's referred to as Ada Lovelace, not her, um, his last name of King. Mm -hmm. Um, so she's the countess during this time. So also she has a title. She, during this time for uh, someone with a title to be working on science and math is just so unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, they have three children together, two sons and a daughter. The firstborn died in an English shipyard um, at age 26 after deserting the Navy. Um, the daughter married a poet and became a famous horse breeder in the Middle East, which fantastic, good for her. <laughs> um, and the youngest son inherited the title and spent most of his life at their estate. Uh, together, her and her husband had um, a shared love of horses and also gambling on them. So that's what brought them together um, and kind of kept them together. But he also was very encouraging and he encouraged her to continue to study and to continue to be part of academia when she had responsibilities in the home and especially at a large estate like that. Um, but he was very uh, supportive. He was very much realized her gift and wanted her to, him, her to share it. Um, they socialized in very uh, interesting circles. <laughs> 
I was surprised by some of these. Um, some of their friends included Michael Faraday, Charles Dickens, and Florence Nightingale. So kind of the like who's who of London during this time. But poor Ada suffers from kind of chronic health issues. In 1837, she contracts cholera. Um, she has asthma and digestive issues. Doctors give her opium and laudanum as painkillers. And um, it started to actually change her personality. She's having mood swings, hallucinations, so not great. Um, and she also, because it's the Victorian time, as Samantha pointed out, um, is trying mesmerism, which is basically like hypnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and then as Samantha also pointed out to me, it kind of just disappears after Victorian times too, which is a lot of what happens with kind of these new wave, Victorian new wave medical approaches. Mm -hmm. um, her health continues to grow dire in 1852. Doctors finally admit she has cancer. Um, by August 1852, she wrote, I begin to understand death, which is going on quietly and gradually every minute and will never be a thing of one particular moment. And so right after she writes that, basically August 19th, um, she asks Charles Dickens to visit her and read her an account of death from one of her, his books. A little grim. Um, her mother moves home to help her during this time. And then on November 27th, 1852, at just the age of 36, she dies from uterine cancer, just like, well, and her father died at the same age too. Mm -hmm. um, Florence Nightingale, who was a nursing pioneer and her friend wrote, they said she could not possibly have lived so long were it not for the tremendous vitality of the brain that could not die. Um, she is, ends up being buried next to her father, Lord Byron, in a graveyard at the Church of St. Mary Magdalene in Nottingham, England. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which her mom was not too happy that she had put in her will that she wanted to be buried next to her father, but, you know, that's how it is. Um, so, legacy. Um, her work? kind of gets a little forgotten for yeah. a, almost like a hundred years. Well, over a hundred years. Um, even though she's considered the first programmer, really her contributions in modern times were recognized when she her work was republished in the 1953 book, um, Faster Than Thought, a Symposium on Digital Computing Machines um, by B.V. Bowden. Um, before this, she had signed her 1843 uh, work AAL, which uh, Ada, Augusta, Augusta Ada Lovelace, um, everybody knew it was her, even though she only published it under initials. Um, but yeah, we just kind of, everyone kind of forgot about it. Uh, it kind of went away until computers mattered again. <laughs> and we started building them. Um, and so because her work was so important, um, the Department of Defense in 1980 named their new computer language Ada in her honor. Um, apparently some people still use that computer language. It's kind of gone by the wayside for new technologies that have come out, um, but some people still like it uh, just because it's familiar and it's also apparently a really secure way to uh, talk on computers. As you can see, I'm not a computer person. Um, so, so. It sounds also though, like her, her work has resurfaced yet again, like a third wave, if you will, with mm -hmm. all of the young uh, women and women in general being called to STEM fields. Um, yeah. I feel like you didn't hear about her until maybe five years ago, really. And then, you know, um, like Google had a, a doodle of them and of Ada. And I feel like there's now an Ada Lovelace day. Um, so, yeah, so October like 11th. <laughs> October 11th, that's great to know. But it feels like it's kind of this resurgence of, of Ada. And that's so mm -hmm. great. Yeah, definitely. I mean, she had this major contribution that affects 
our day-to-day lives. You know what I mean? We're talking on computers right now, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And so it's, it's great that finally with this resurgence and this renewed interest in also women's history, uh, we can talk about her. And, you know, even though she had this very short life, she was very influential. Okay, so as you know, if you have been around, uh, we like to do (laughs) questions. When we did this in person, we used to have more questions and it was a little more interactive, uh, but we like to keep the spirit of it alive. Um, So Jen, how do you think her upbringing influenced her work? Oh, that's, it's a good question. I think that there are several ways that her upbringing influenced her work. One is the fact that her mother wanted him, her so far removed from her um, her father's work that she really worked hard to kind of make it so that she was given opportunities that an average woman would not be able to at that time or an average girl. So um, I think that's one. And I think too, that she's rooted in privilege, right? She has a lot of money. She has a lot of means. She has a title later in life. And so she has the ability to, to study, to get tutors, to be able to be in a room where she can meet someone like Babbage to form these partnerships. Um, so I kind of feel like it's a, a two-way thing. One is very rooted in privilege and the other is almost rooted in heartbreak because it's because the mom doesn't want her to be like her own father. Um, so that's a little, uh, mm-hmm. but I think that the two of them together create this dynamic experience for this young woman because she dies very young. Um, but something that changes kind of the course of, of science history in particular, because like you said, we're on computers now and she was helping. Her mind was so different than how I think, or I'm assuming you think. Too. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, very different from, from that. And I, I agree. I think that her mother had more of an influence on her than a lot of young people at this time, um, because she was brought up in privilege. Um, yeah, she, she didn't just go to like finishing school Mm -hmm. or just learn, you know, something of the arts. Um, like playing the piano or another instrument in order to entertain at parties. Her mom had her learn those math and skills and things like that in addition to um, writing and uh, focusing on that more analytical side really, you know, changed Mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we want to know what you think too. So after you watch this, please let us know in the comments. What did you think? Um, did her upbringing influence work? Did it not? Um, you know, how did everything we just talked about influence her work? We'd love to hear from you. Definitely. All right. So in January, there will be a program on Victoria Woodhull. Uh, we're doing this one, uh, in conjunction because we are going to have a female vice president. So we want to talk about the first woman to run for president, even though spoiler alert, she wasn't even old enough to run for president when she ran for president. (laughs) So another Victorian woman, uh, it's going to be great. Her life is really weird. It's true. (laughs) It's going to be awesome. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next month. Bye everyone.